Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Don Farish, president here at the university, and uh, this is a, a series of talks we're having this year under the theme of talking about race, gender, and power. So lots of things fall under this umbrella, and tonight we have a special treat. A hundred years ago, a woman named Hannah, uh, well, you see the name here, Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, came to this country, 1917, on a speaking tour. It was a year after her husband, an editor in Ireland, had been killed by the British during the 1916 uprising. And she was both a suffragette and a nationalist, so she was carrying a lot of weight on her shoulders, and came to speak in, in this country, because it was at a time where in much of the Western Europe and the United States, uh, women were vying for the right to vote, and it was a contentious era. And at the same time, Ireland was vying to get independent of England. So there was a lot that was going on at, at that era. Um, a lot of controversy during Hannah's visit uh, to this country. She was feted in some areas and um, assailed in others. Uh, at one point was threatened with being kidnapped and taken to Canada, the horror, um, and then taken back to Ireland. That didn't actually happen. But the point is, it was, not, um, it was not a time that we can easily relate to 100 years later. And sometimes it's just useful to be able to look back and think about what life was like 100 years ago, especially for women who were completely disenfranchised. So here we are, 2017, 100 years later, and, and Hannah's granddaughter, Micheline, is, in a sense, repeating her grandmother's quest. She's not visiting every site, but she's going to a number of cities around the country. She's traveled by boat from Ireland uh, to uh, the United States, just as her grandmother did. And it, 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 in revisiting um, some of the same sites that her grandmother spoke at 100 years ago, and in the process, um, kind of recapturing the era and the issues that were so important at that time. But it isn't just a revisit of her grandmother's experience because Micheline um, has had her own adventures. Um, she ended up suing her employer for gender discrimination for failure to, uh, she works for a university, for failure to be promoted um, based on her gender. So there's something going on in this family that um, uh, it's a feisty group and, and her position is women have come a long way, but they're not all the way there yet. And so uh, with that, I want to uh, take pleasure in introducing Micheline Sheehy Skeffington. Thanks very much. That was a wonderful introduction. Thank you, President Farish and Mrs. Farish. For, I was hosted to a wonderful dinner as well in the president's house. So. Um, hopefully I'll be still coherent after it. Um, yes, I suppose I do come from a long line of troublemakers and jailbirds, and I've learned to be proud of it. In fact, my grandmother was left-handed like me, and I was told when I was small, because I remember kind of looking up at my father that, you know, you inherited this, and your grandmother was proud when she was smashing windows in Dublin Castle, I explain that later. Um, they automatically immobilized her right hand, and she was able to have another go. <laughs> with her left hand. You know, and it's only later you realize, well, actually maybe not many young girls are told to be proud of their grandmother who went to prison for smashing windows, you know, so. But th I think that sense of family pride in doing something, doing action, um, she's even quoted in the press when she was over here in the States as saying, you know, my father and my uncle Eugene, they were Fenians, they went to prison. Owen, my son, who was with her when she came, he's used to visiting his parents in prison. So there was a, a kind of a pride in it. And it's not that unusual, I think, for Irish families, given our history of rebellion and that. But certainly uh, my family had. So yes, I'm here because I'm trying to commemorate what Hannah did, because what she did in the States is little known in Ireland. Um, she's known mostly as a feminist and as a suffragette. And I really want to try and have that uh, a little bit more put on the map. But I'd better get through it because there's a lot of stories to tell and some I may just not tell and say, ask me about it later because otherwise you'll be here for a too long a time. I want to try and um, shorten it. So uh, many of you will know that we had a revolution in 1916 in Easter week, um, as President Farish said. And the, the first day, Easter Monday, the leaders, Parik Pierce, the leader, read out the proclamation, which was declaring a republic 
um, in Ireland and saying we're going to fight now to establish this and started, they started the fighting, occupied the general post office, the GPO and lots of buildings. But I thought it was interesting, there are just two um, pieces here I pulled out from it. The Republic guarantees religious and civil liberty, equal rights and equal opportunities to all its citizens. Now that word citizen I'll come back to. Um, a permanent, also to establish a permanent national government representative of the whole people of Ireland and elected by the suffrages of all the men and women. So that proclamation read in 1916 was well ahead of its time. It was saying that all men and women, because even then men didn't have all the, the vote, only men of property over the age of 30 or 32 could vote. And this is saying everybody's going to elect our, our national government. So it's quite a radical um, proclamation. It's worth reading. It's quite short relative to most constitutions and that. But what I say is I know my grandparents had every bit to do with the, particularly that last sentence. They were not in combatants in the rising. They were very much in favor of independence. They were also very friendly with several of the leaders of the, pro of the, of the rising. And um, the, several of the leaders were very sympathetic to women getting vote and equality. So I think they were all the one, and I'm sure that they had a, a hand, if not a hand, certainly a part in the phrasing of that. So who were my grandparents? Just briefly, Hannah is here on the far left. She was the eldest of a family of, uh, of, um, of five, six, she has five siblings. And um, her father, David, she, he's here, and her uncle Eugene. And Eugene was the priest in the family. And both of them, as I said, were Fenians, and they had fought during the Fenian Rising in the 60, 1867 um, and been to prison, basically, both of them for, for that. Bessie McCoy, who became Bessie Sheehy, Elizabeth McCoy, I've learned recently also came from a, a line of rebels because her brothers were imprisoned in Kilmainham in Dublin as well. And the local priest in Ballyhahill in County Limerick, where she, she grew up, which wasn't far from where the Sheehys grew up, um, the local priest refused to say the rosary to pray for their well-being. And so she said, right, well, I'm going to lead the rosary. We'll come back to the church later on this evening and I'll lead the rosary. So this is a 16-year-old who defies the local priest to lead the rosary for her rebel brothers. So there's, a, there's a quite a bit of rebel in her. And indeed, her sister, um, Kate Barry, as she became, also um, was involved in the Ladies' Land League. The Land League was founded by Michael Davitt, and that was to, to help support people who were being evicted because the landed people, the, the landed gentry, were finding that people weren't being able to pay their rent. Now remember that David and Eugene were born in the early 1840s. Their early childhood lived through the Great Hunger Time. 1845 was our Great Hunger in Ireland. And they lived through that and the hardship that it was uh, uh, afterwards. And people were being evicted because they couldn't afford to pay the rent. So the Land League was working with those people and also trying to encourage them to, to, have, to be housed and building temporary huts and things like that to get them housed. So it was a, a grassroots... Um, movement and Davitt, Michael Davitt who founded it was very aware that you can't have a revolution without having the grassroots with you and he was therefore the hero of my grandfather who I'll talk about in a minute. But this is perhaps not surprising, Hannah tells of how they, as, as children they lived, they, she was born in Cork but she grew up in Lockmore in County Tipperary for her early years. They used to play at evictions uh, in the mill where they lived and they, would, they said nobody wanted to act as the bailiffs, everybody wanted to be the poor evicted family. Um, and this is a, 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 a stitch work which is done by Hannah Sheehy when she was aged eight, and it says, My Land League Hut. So was this a class project? Did she do it on her own? But it certainly shows that she was definitely going to house the poor evicted peoples in something pretty grand. It's an amazing piece of work, and that's aged eight. So she's quite aware of injustices and, and wants to play a role, obviously, in, in, in Ireland as it was going to emerge. And I think it sets a little bit of the picture of how, how she grew up and, and thought. Francis then was very different. He had a different upbringing. He was born in County Cavan, and then the family moved very soon to Down Patrick in County Down, which is where his father was from. And the father was a schools inspector, and it says a lot about what he thought about the schools because he didn't send Frank to school at all. 
he brought him up at home. He, he was very well taught. Frank himself says that his father was his best teacher, educator, and he was very widely read. And aged 11, the young Frank said, well, yeah, I got first interested in feminism because I read a thing by W.T. Stead about Gladstone, who was one of the British leaders. And uh, Stead said that Gladstone had done nothing for women. So the 11-year-old thinks, oh, yes, we should do something for women. So it kind of shows <laughs> what kinds of people they were going to grow up to if they're thinking like that um, uh, in, in, in their youth. Uh, Frank was unconventional in every way, and I think some of it might have to do with the fact that he didn't have the sibling pressure. You know, when you're in school, you want to conform, you want to be like your friends and all of that. I don't know. He might have been like that anyway, but he stood out. He, it wasn't that unusual to have plus fours, but he was definitely, you know, one of the few that wore them all the time. And he said he could get about easier on a bicycle. Um, but actually, it was a matter of principle that he never conformed to formal dress. He actually turned down a small job in the university because he would have had to have worn a formal frock coat. He said, no, that's against my principles. Um, he was a very strong nationalist, as Hannah was indeed, um, wanting independence from Britain uh, quite fervently, uh, an ardent feminist, as I've said. Um, a socialist, as Hannah was as well, so you know the Land League and, and the, the people's rights and socialism for everybody was his thing. Um, but he was even more than Hannah, he was a pacifist. She was a pacifist. They didn't believe in combat, and I'll come back to that. Um, he was a militant pacifist. People think that being passi passive is the same as being a pacifist. He was anything but. He was also a vegetarian, a uh, teetotaler, an anti-vivisectionist, and people used to say, you know, he's just an old crank. I mean, people liked him, but a crank. And he'd say, yes, a crank is a small instrument that causes revolutions. <laughs> so he was imperturbable. He, again, he didn't care what people thought about him. He just wanted to get his message across. Whatever it was he was campaigning for, he would keep doing it. And that's actually immortalized in James Joyce in Portrait of the Artist. He, he, he's McCann, or Joyce used to call him Harry Jesus. Um, he, they were at college together. Joyce was a little bit younger, but they knew each other. They were all, Hannah's brothers were in school with, with, Joyce's, uh, with Joyce, uh, so they, they knew each other. So that's Harry Jesus. I think it's a good picture. Um, he's with William O'Brien here, um, and they're deep in political discussion, I think. And Frank is going around with some kind of you know, print, newsprint, because he was always publishing things and getting ideas out and getting discussion going. So his first publication was a separate pamphlet because he, he, he was refused um, publication in the, the, the university magazine. He was by then a student in the Royal University, which is now UCD in Dublin. And his piece was a forgotten aspect of the university question. And the this, this same James A. Joyce had written something as well, totally different, quite a pompous piece about the rabble getting into the arts and you know, all of that. But both were rejected. So they came together and said, right, well, let's get this published together. So Frank's one is this forgotten aspect of the university question. And of course, it's about equality for women. Because the, the women students were not allowed to attend lectures with the men. God forbid that they would might distract the men. They were in different buildings somewhere else, on well, the other side of Stevens Green. Um, but also, as he says, he has statistics showing that women, of course, were getting at least as many honors degrees as the men, but they weren't allowed into the societies. So the big debating society that Frank and Joyce and indeed Tom Kettle, who was a barrister and a, a well-known orator, uh, they were part of and revived, the women couldn't even come to their meetings. So that was real exclusion, and he says that in that. So I'd like to say, as I come back to it again later, that I, that aspect of the university question is still a bit forgotten. And it's kind of interesting. It was his first publication. So it's not surprising that Hannah and Frank, Hannah became amazed and disgusted when she was in university and realized she hadn't got the vote. She hadn't really, I suppose, thought about it truly and then realized, I want to make a change in Ireland, and yet I can't even have that fundamental right to make a change. I haven't got the vote. Um, so she was a strong feminist anyway, and she realized the campaign for the vote is the most fundamental thing we must do. And it's uh, uh, not surprising they found common cause. And in 1903, they got married. And what's interesting is that they each took each other's name. Francis Skeffington became Sheehy Skeffington, and Hannah Sheehy became Sheehy Skeffington. I won't ask the men in the audience to put up their hands who've taken their wives' names. But it is very unusual. And his family was really kind of put out by diluting the good Skeffington name. 
the Sheehy family we took it a little bit more in their stride. But that's where the name comes from. And we were just debating if Frank seemed to sign with a hyphen. A lot of us don't, but um, it's a feminist statement, if you like. Um, the interesting thing is that my mother, my mother knew Hannah and not Frank uh, because he was murdered, as it was said, the president said, in 1916. But um, she said that this was their wedding photograph. Now, there's two things. I think it's the first formal photo taken after they were married, which is a different thing. It's done in a studio, which was always done in those days. It was probably not what they wore at their wedding. They were married in the university church on Stevens Green. But in those days, it was really important for women to show that they, could, they were graduates. They had only been granted access to the university for about 20 years prior to that. And so if they had a, a, a degree, then they often had pictures taken of themselves with the, the gowns. And these are their MA gowns. And I suspect Frank is wearing his in solidarity. So this is equality. Uh, and because they're married, this is the kind of statement they have. So it's kind of interesting to see that. It's not quite their wedding photo, but still. So um, they're, they're impatient with the fact that uh, they were, had joined the, the Irish Women's Local Suffrage and uh, Local Government and Suffrage Association, which was kind of writing letters to the Irish party, which was represented, of course, remember the parliament is in London. Hannah's father was in the Irish party. And the Irish party really wanted home rule, which was the kind of idea of independence or independent rule, if you like, in Ireland. And it didn't want the suffrage, this women's business, to get in the way. It might jeopardize yet another attempt to get the Home Rule Bill through. So the younger women, remember, these are all young students. They're 20-something-year-olds. They're getting impatient with this genteel kind of letter writing and that. And this side, Hannah and Margaret Cousins, founded the Irish Women's Franchise League. And this is Hannah on the left. This is actually Meg Con Connery. Um, and that is the banner that they had, uh, which uh, is part of it. But this is actually what it looked like. I grew up with this in the corner somewhere. I didn't have as much respect as I should have had. It's now in the National Museum in Dublin. If you're ever there, go and ask to see it. It's not on display. It will be on a touring display during next year because it's the anniversary of uh, Ireland with Britain getting the vote for women. There's several things about this. Um, the colours... They are mindful of what's happening in England, um, in, in Britain. The suffrage movement was very active and uh, had, had started being more proactive before the Irish ones were. Um, but their colours were green and purple. So people think, oh, the suffrage colours are green and purple. Well, actually, the suffrage colours here were um, purple and gold. So they're different colours. And this here, uh, as you realise, these are the Irish colours. Green and orange was the statement of Republican independence. We are all for doing the same thing, but this is Ireland, and we're having different colours. Um, this, of course, is the kind of Gaelic revival embroidery, and it was done by the Dunemer Guild, which was set up by the Yates sisters, W.B. Yates and Jack Yates' sisters. So very much into reviving the culture of Ireland with the shamrocks. And then you've got Comanachty Gore, Cotterman and Amman on the, uh, on the other side, be it the front or the back. And they were very proud of that. They brought it to London. There's a picture of them all with it in London. And having it in Irish, I think, is really interesting. Now, the interesting thing is the translation there is not suffrage or franchise. It's justice. The, the association in favor of justice for women. I, I don't know enough to know whether that is deliberate or not, but I think it's an interesting way of phrasing it. So that's a kind of Republican suffrage statement, if you like. Um, so, uh, the Franchise League started to be more proactive and um, they would harangue people and they started, to, it was a platform which I grew up with, which was a fold-out platform and it said votes for women on it and Hannah would be one of them. They'd just speak out anywhere and everywhere. Remember in those days, people couldn't afford to rent halls. People spoke in public all the time in various places. Phoenix Park was a popular place because people could gather there and they just went around and basically had to face the crowd. They had, had tomatoes thrown at them. They had heckling. They had everything. Thank God nobody's done that to me yet here. Um, but, you know, it was hard. But they cut their teeth on that. And it was always the women who, who, you know, put forward their right to have the vote, which is, of course, important. They're articulate enough for themselves. But Frank was a journalist, and he was getting frustrated at not getting published enough to cover everything that the women were doing. Um, and some of you may know that, and I know it as a campaign, or you know, as a campaign I'll talk about later. 
um, that it's very hard to get it covered in the press. So he founds the Irish Citizen with James Cousins, um, who's Margaret Cousins' husband. And um, they, they, this is just one particular front page of it. And you see here, that's the picture of Hannah again. And this is Margaret Cousins also with her graduation gown. So that was quite common. And then the pictures, women, nationalist, unionist, militant, non-militant from London, Belfast, and so on. That isn't the point I'm, going, I'm making, but the actual citizen, um, the banner headline at the top was in, on the front page of every issue of a citizen. Uh, and this is pure frank. Um, for men and women equally, the rights of citizenship. From men and women equally, the duties of citizenship. And that was something I think that was inculcated in the family. My father really felt that you had to have a duty to do right by your fellow human beings. It wasn't enough just to have an equal right. And sometimes we tend to think, yeah, yeah, I want my rights, I want my rights. Yeah, but you have a duty to do something with that right. And it's, I think that's pure frank to, to say, well, yeah, we need to do more to make things better for the less advantage in our society. And, and the vote could do that in particular. The other thing, I don't know if it strikes you, I mentioned the word citizen. Does that strike you as unusual, if you know anything about the, what I've been saying or Irish history generally? It's Irish people were not citizens. They were subjects of the crown. They were not independent. A citizen is like here, where you've got a, a republic and independence. They're not subjects of a crown. The British are not citizens. Um, the Spanish are not citizens, the French are, they have a republic. So it's quite a strong statement, again, because Ireland is not independent. So this is another thing. Somebody pointed this out once when I gave a talk in Boston College, and I thought, yeah, of course. So again, subtly kind of getting the message across while still talking about the equal rights for women. So uh, at the same time then, um, as I s s was mentioning at the beginning, uh, the women were getting impatient, nothing was happening, and they said, right, we're going to do like what they're doing in, in London, and we're going to smash windows and get ourselves arrested. And Hannah said, I want to smash windows in Dublin Castle, because that was the seat of British power. I'm going to have a go at the British while I'm at it, smash their windows while I'm doing it. The others went to the, the, um, the custom house in different buildings. Um, and then that's when the story is that Hannah managed to get another go at the, the Dublin Castle windows before she was obviously taken away. And of course, the real thing was to get themselves noticed, to get themselves covered in the press, to uh, the citizen covered it, but also it was, you know, women suffragettes smash windows. This is the first time in Dublin it's happened, and it gets noticed. They get sentenced, they got about six weeks each, and they were in different cohorts, and, and Hannah and uh, three or four others were sentenced first. And in June, I think it was, um, the Prime Minister of England came over, Asquith, and two English suffragettes came over with him and threw a mock hatchet at his carriage and, of course, got themselves arrested into Mount Joy Prison with the, with the, with the women. But what do the English suffragettes do? But they promptly go on hunger strike. And there's consternation amongst the Irish women because this is their first time in prison. They're only just getting used to being locked away. And suddenly there's these women doing what they were doing already in England, going on hunger strike. And they, they decided in the end that Hannah was one of the, the, her cohort was about actually to be released. They'd served all but five days of their term. So they decided that they would go in solidarity on hunger strike. They didn't really expect to do it. And she said it was kind of, you know, I didn't know tea had a smell. But the one thing she was worried about was she'd hear a group of people, a body of people coming down the corridor. And she was in fear and dread that they were going to come and force feed her. Because that's what they were doing in London, where they were force feeding the suffragettes who were in, in there. So to, to prevent them, you know, dying, obviously, but prevent them losing weight and losing that, they were force feeding them. Horrible, uh, violent thing to do. Uh, as it happens, they didn't force feed her. They released her, and that's her release. She looks a bit weak and thin. Uh, that's Frank, and then notice Uncle Eugene's the one who meets her. I don't know who the man at the back is, but her Uncle Eugene's there, not her father. He was always much more supportive of whatever she did. Um, but as soon as they released the, the Irish women, they force-fed the English suffragettes. And it was interesting. They weren't to know that because, you know, it might have changed, but they never actually did force-feed the Irish women on Irish soil. It was obviously just a step too far. They knew that that might just cause trouble. They force-fed Irish women in England and English women wherever, but not uh, there. So they were, she was released without the force-feeding, but the two English were force-fed. So... Uh, not a, a great scenario. So that's 
kind of what's going on through Dublin. There's many suffragettes. They were also being sent down the country because they'd have rallies outside Mountjoy Prison. It was causing too much of a rumpus, so they sent them to Tullamore Jail and so on. This is all ongoing. Um, this is the, the next time Hannah got arrested, and I think this is a great bit of photojournalism. Um, this is Meg Connery. This is the Irish citizen. She has questions for Boner Law. He was the, the chair of the Conservative Party at the time. This is 1913. And she's obviously going to ask him, what the hell is he doing about women and women's vote? Um, this, you might recognize this uncompromising gent is Edward Carson, staunch unionist, totally, you know, probably even ill at ease in Dublin. This is in the, uh, on the Green Ivy House. And then, of course, the policeman rushing to grab her and arrest her. Um, but what my mother told me is that Hannah told her that the people here looking into the middle distance, she was in the crowd, equally about to do something, and the policeman saw her and arrested her before she actually managed to do anything at all. And she was raging. She said, the next time I get arrested, I'm going to deserve it. Because she was thrown in prison. She hadn't done anything except just be arrested. So I think it's a, it's a good piece and a good story to tell. I don't know if Boner Law actually managed to take the things, but I don't think he did much about it, even if he did. So ongoing activism. But then, of course, the next year is the break, uh, outbreak of the First World War. And that's the, the British suffragettes kind of down tools said, right, we've got to do our thing for the war effort. The Irish women thought, well, that's British, Britain's war. We're not in, in, at war with Germany. We're Irish. We're not going to you know, can stop campaigning for the equal right for vote. So they carried on right through it. But Frank is the, is the pacifist. So this is what the poster he brought out. Um, so the poor man believed, I think, once we got the vote, that maybe we'd have an end to war. I say we haven't had equality yet, so perhaps, you know, we will someday have an end to war. Sadly, I'm not sure. Um, there's a story about this, which I might tell you later if you ask me, because it could take a while, but it involves his five-year-old son being kind of involved in protecting this poster at home. Um, but as I say, I, I fear to go on too long, and I think we'll, we'll leave it and uh, it'll entertain you for another minute at the end if, you, if, you're still, if you're still awake. It's very warm in here, I notice. Um, so, yeah, he's campaigning against um, the war, and what he does is, as a pacifist, he says, I don't want British you know, recruitment in Ireland. Uh, this is the British war. I'm against war. I'm a pacifist. Um, but also, it's your war, it's not ours. I don't want Irish people being recruited. And of course, the British had had quite enough of that. After 40 speeches around town again, anywhere public that he could, they arrested him and tried him for seditious speeches because they're at war, you can't do this. Um, and he just wanted to get his message across, basically. Now, at the same time, or the, the next year, and I just want to put this in first, is that... Um, this is an open letter. Thomas McDonough was one of the signatories of the proclamation that I put up, um, one of the seven. He was a good friend of Frank. They, were, uh, they taught in uh, St. Kieran's College in Kilkenny, and they were perhaps the closest but with, with Connolly, I think those three or four, my Hannah as well. Um, so then McDonough had actually spoken at a Franchise League meeting, and Frank says in this open letter, he says, um, I, was, um, I didn't join the volunteers, which was grouping up for, to try and have a rebellion um, on feminist grounds because the volunteers didn't let women be part of it. The Common Naman was the women's group. Hannah didn't join Common Naman because she refused to be a member of a body that was ostensibly subservient to the decision-making body. So neither joined either, even though they all had similar ideas. It's not like they were completely separate. And he said, I'm glad I didn't now because it sounds like you're arming up and it's far too militaristic what you said the last time at the Franchise League meeting. And it's a famous thing. It was actually put online by the Irish Times again last year in 1916. And he says, can you not conceive of a body of people grouped together with one single objective and one focus, but which does not have as its fundamental objective, I shall kill my fellow human beings? So in other words, can you find another way to do this? I'm every bit behind you. I want independence. I'm not prepared to kill for my objectives. So the parallel. So it's not just anti-Britain. It's, it's anti-war that he's... he's talking about. So he's sent to prison, he's tried and he's sentenced to, to six months hard labor. Um, he defends himself, couldn't afford anything else, but also he saw it as an opportunity. He's very into dialogue, speech, getting people to discuss things. That's how you resolve things. And in a way, he's right. People could manage that. It often doesn't come to that until the, after fighting. And um, he then says, I'll soon be out of prison, alive or dead. Promptly goes on hunger strike. 
and he's held in prison for, for a while and then he goes on thirst strike. Now, if you know anything about thirst strike, that's really dangerous. Um, and so the British realise, I bet we'd better release this man because he's popular, he's well known, he's a Republican. If he dies in prison, this would be not good. So he was released um, uh, while he was on hunger strike. And it just shows that he's not afraid to put his own life in danger. Because again, you think pacifists are just running away from things. No, he wasn't. He just wasn't prepared to kill and he put his own life in danger again during the rising, trying to save a British officer who'd been killed. Yeah. Thirst. He didn't drink. Thirst strike. Yeah, please stop me if you didn't, because uh, I'm probably talking a little bit fast. No, yes, trying to get through. I do, I know. And then we do say it, sometimes we say thirst as well. Instead of thirst, so he didn't drink. So you don't survive that for long. So he was released. And he was actually released under what was known as the Cat and Mouse Act, which they had brought in to dissolve the, the tension around the British hunger strikers. It was the Temporary Release Due to Ill Health Act. And if you were in ill health, which you would be if you're not eating for several days, um, then you could be released, but you could be taken in without charge, and without trial, and put back in prison. So it was like a cat playing with a mouse and taking it back in again. And it was a real clever way to diffuse the whole thing. He was released, and he said, I'm on holidays. He came to the States and said, I'm on holidays under the Cat and Mouse Act. Because <laughs> he realized he couldn't really be active in Ireland, because he would have been just put in prison again, and he didn't see the point of that. So he actually came over. He was in, in the States in 1915. Um, got very active in things, met loads of feminist, uh, Republican, obviously, groups, nationalists and everything, and kind of set up a bit of a network um, there. And He said, it's wonderful here, and the telephone is just amazing. We must have one when we come back, because obviously, communication and all that. So he was impressed with the States. I came home at Christmas time, and then, of course, Connolly says to them both, if you want a bit of you know, interest, then stick around for Easter week, 1916. So they stay around. The rising is declared in, on Easter Monday, and they both go into town. Um, and Hannah actually goes to the GPO. She doesn't take up arms, but she helps with messages and all, you know, doing things. And Frank realizes that there's a lot of people looting the shops. And it's interesting, because he didn't care about property, but he cared about the image of the rising. And he actually went to the GPO and said, what's going on with these looters? This is terrible, it's a bad image. And they said, yeah, we know. We've actually been trying to stop them. and We've been firing over their heads. But you know, we're kind of busy here. <laughs> um, so do what you can, but we don't seem to be able to stop them. So they were of a mind that this didn't look good because the British press would immediately seize on that and say, this is just a bunch of Irish rabble rousers and there's nothing in it. We have only uh, people trying to get loot shops. So it was that intention that he was doing, and he, he did that on, on two days in a row. But on the Tuesday, walking home, he was taken off the street by one of the British officers. He, lived, he had to pass Portobello Barracks, where the British were uh, staged, and because um, he was well known. You know, oh, that's she, Skeffington, let's just take him off the street. You know, they weren't being very rational. They were just taking people who were in the boat. And then that evening, he was taken out because um, there was a curfew. And the, the Captain Bowen Coulters took him out from his cell. He had no permission to do this. Took him as a hostage, hands tied behind his back. And they were firing around the streets just to try and prevent snipers firing at them. And they rec the captain reckoned that if they were fired on, that they would realize that Sheehy Skeffington would be shot. So he's a hostage, you know, to kind of keep people from firing at them. And then they met two boys, two teenage boys coming from a church and challenged them, what are you doing? This is a curfew, you're not supposed to be out and all that. And I don't know what they did, but one of them anyway, they may have turned around a bit suddenly or, you know, God knows, teenage boys, 17. And uh, Coulters just said, bash him to one of his soldiers. And the soldier just got his butt of his rifle and hit him. And it transpired he broke his jaw. Boy fell to the ground, Coulters pulls out a pistol and shoots him dead. Now, in anybody's book, that's murder. Frank pacifist standing there, hands behind his back, makes a whole speech about this and how uh, appalling this is. And, you know, uh, and one of the soldiers apparently said he was really eloquent and brave. And Coulter says, you shut up, mate, you're next. Or something along that line. Spent the night reading the Bible, found something as one does in the Bible, which suits, you take forth thine enemies and slay them, uh, something like that. And he took him out the next day, again without permission, quite clearly, and brought him into the, in the backyard of the guardroom and shot him, firing squad. And two other journalists were taken out with them, Thomas Dixon and Patrick McIntyre. They were only shot because they were journalists. 
And, and what seems to be is that Coulthurst realized this man is a journalist, he's a pacifist, he's outspoken, he's after witnessing something that's wrong, I've got to get rid of him. But there's two other journalists, they're going to write about this, I've got to get rid of them as well. Mm. And Hannah never heard formally ever what happened to Frank. And um, that's the, the, she was pointing to a, a full inquiry here because there was never a full inquiry about what happened to him. She wanted the whole truth about what happened. And this, the house was raided two days later. So this is the 28th of April, 1916. He was shot on the 26th, looking for evidence against the man they'd shot, murdered. Um, so this is Coulter's. I certify that this was found in Skeffington's house, J.C. Bowen Coulter's captain, um, 28th of April. That's the boys drawing, probably six-year-old drawing. You've been fascinated with Zeppelins. These are supposed to be German flags. They were German sympathizers. This is evidence against the man they've just murdered. And, and for some reason, that got returned to Hannah. She didn't get all his papers back. But that's the sort of level of it. Um, and of course, she never got the truth, the, the full inquiry. He was tried. He was promoted first. And then he was finally arrested, tried guilty but insane. And Hannah always maintained he's not insane. A man, I, well, I say, and I think uh, that's what she would have said, is a man who can calculate, OK, I, that was murder. This man's a journalist. He's witnessed it. He's outspoken. Um, I've got to get rid of him. And then there's two journalists. I've got to get rid of them. He's not that insane. It's all calculated. Um, and of course, being sentenced insane, he was sent to Broadmoor for, for the insane. And he was released two years later and went to Vancouver in Canada. I'm going to go to Vancouver. Um, I've got a cousin there, and we're going to try and maybe just discuss. We can't find the Coulter's family, but they did. He lived out his life boasting about what he'd done in Ireland, you know. So while Hannah's going through trying to find out what's happened, she went to Prime Minister Asquith in London, and she said, "I want the truth. That that, that sentencing was not right. I want a full inquiry." And he said, "Oh no, that's not possible. You know, you couldn't possibly have a proper inquiry. Um, would you take ten thousand pounds?" And that's a about the equivalent of nearly a million dollars today. She didn't even hear the sum. She said, I'm not interested in hush money. I want the truth. I want this all to come out you know, in public. And there was a public inquiry. It wasn't full truth. Coulter's wasn't there. Key witnesses weren't there. She wasn't happy with it at all. She said, right, I'm going to the States. I'm going to tell the truth. The trouble was the British said, you can't have a passport. <laughs> So this, she went to Glasgow. She disguised herself and her son Owen. They went to Glasgow through Northern Ireland and appeared in Glasgow. The Skinner family uh, received her and, and, and got a, uh, she got the persona of Mrs. Mary Gribbon, who had emigrated maybe a year earlier. And the, this is a passport photo, and it says on the back, I swear by almighty God that this is Mrs. Mary Gribbon, and then it's signed so-and-so PP. So a parish priest committed minor perjury to, to, to kind of back up the fact that Mary Gribbon is about to sail to the States. So she set sail, and this is really my adventure now, is to try and find out and think what it was like. Herself and Owen set sail in December 1916. The Lusitania had been sunk. The seas were full of submarines. The Laconia was sunk not long after. It's in the headlines while her speech is being covered. Um, she didn't know she was going to be admitted. She didn't know she was going to be arrested. Owen is actually very sick. Um, but for a quirky reason, which again I'll explain later, Owen had acquired a Glasgow accent. So she pushed Owen in front and got him to speak away because obviously she's tried to be a Glaswegian, but she has an Irish accent. Um, so the, the, she kind of kept a low profile, I suspect, on the ship. And then landed, as I said, not in, uh, well, I didn't, I said it this evening, she, they don't land, ships don't land in Ellis Island. She was second class, so she was let off in Manhattan. Third class passengers are shipped to Ellis Island and processed there. And the ship's manifest is brought with them and it, it is entered in Ellis Island. But Ellis Island people don't actually, she didn't go there. Um, but she was set free. There was nothing, and I think the states were kind of, as one of the men in, in Ellis Island said, George Sellos, he said, well, she wasn't a criminal. Like, criminals had warrants for arrest. She wasn't a criminal. The British wanted her arrested, but, you know, so they let her free. And then within a day, there's a press cutting saying, Mrs. Sheehy Skeffington is in the Hotel Earl in, in downtown Manhattan, and in terrible state of, you know, fragility. I think that was a smoke screen. I don't think she, she was at that stage. Um, please don't go near her. And within weeks, she filled Carnegie Hall. 
the place with book Carnegie Hall was actually I learned quite open to people activists feminists were using it but there was a big cohort of people and I've learned that probably a lot of the people who knew Frank came a lot of the Irish Americans who'd heard all about what had happened, well, not all about it, but wanted to hear all about what had happened in 1916, came. Socialists, all groups of people came to that. It was a memorial for Frank Sheehy Skeffington. It wasn't one cohort, and it was pretty amazing. And I was there, and I actually stood on the stage. We were taken backstage to, to do that. We couldn't film, you know, you know, it cost eight grand, $8,000, said, right, I think we won't film there. Um, but um, we stood on the stage and just imagine what it was like. She came out and uh, the whole place is full of people, you know, and there was lots of cheers and support for her. I think then she must have realized, right, I'm launched. I don't have to be incognito. I'd be Hannah Shee Skeffington. And she went on. She didn't know probably even then that she stayed for 18 months and toured all around the United States. Um, she went to 21 different states and made about 250 speeches uh, about Irish cause. Basically, her title was British Militarism as I have known it. That's her and Owen. I just want to point out that there's a Foley's are everywhere. E.F. Foley. Um, and it says Fifth, I presume it's Fifth Avenue, the photographs. Where is she? Um, it's thanks to the Foley's I'm here. <laughs> Um, so that's, a, they were obviously journalists and taking photos and things, that's the two of them arrived. But Owen's been decked out in fancy new tweed suit and a Tara brooch and everything. There's no way that they had the money for any of that. Um, so that's just a companion of cuttings and things. And yeah, there are, again, I could tell you maybe later, there was a, a she tells of an attempt to kidnap her, her. It's reported in the Chicago or not in the Chicago Press, but some newspaper that has it. It's a cutting she has in her paper, so I don't even know what paper it came out of. The idea was that somebody, some group, tried to lure her onto a, a train in a town near the border on her way to Buffalo, um, and that train was bound for Canada. If she got into Canada, she would have been arrested. It was a British protectorate. I know I've seen letters where they say, don't come to Alaska, because you'll have to go through Canadian waters. I'm not quite, she couldn't have gone overland, but they said don't. So there was that, that fear all the time. The British were kind of only too ready to arrest her. Um, so that's the story in a nutshell, if you like. Um, so she went over to San Francisco several times. Owen, in the end, came with her and went to school in California, which was a better climate. He'd started in Connecticut. And um, he, he stayed there while she continued to go back and over. And in San Francisco, she filled the Dreamland Auditorium, which had a capacity of 8,000, several times. And her entire speech is printed on the broadsheets of the front page. You know, so people were really interested in what she had to say. But when she went back, she filled the Dreamland Auditorium. And then within days, she was asked um, by the, the, the Machinist Society, uh, the, the San Francisco Labor Society, to support Tom Mooney. Tom Mooney was in the Industrial Workers of the World. These are the Wobblies. These were the socialist workers, activists. They were really radical. Um, and Mooney had been framed for a bomb that had gone off in San Francisco. He hadn't actually been in the town at the time, the city. Uh, and he was in prison. And it shows how much Hannah was held in regard because she's asked to speak as keynote speaker for this. And she was more than willing. And that, I think, is one of the things I want to explore in the documentary is her socialist, feminist connections. Maybe a lot of her talk was about Ireland at that time, but she had connections and supported the socialist groups very much so as well. And it's my thought is that around that time, she no longer was able to get venues for talks. She was actually arrested out of one venue. People were saying, oh, she's speaking against our ally, Britain. But actually, Britain was an ally since the US joined the war in 1917. And this is um, March 1918. So I think this might have been the turning point. The newspapers were probably owned by Irish people, the ones that were publishing her. They were property owners. They were important industrials. They did not like the support of the IWW. And that's just a guess that she realized at that point it was time to go back. She wasn't getting traction anymore, as we say nowadays. And this is the Sinn Féin executive. She joined Sinn Féin, and only later did, was she on the executive. That's her on the far left. You might recognize these boys here in the middle. Kathleen Lynn, Dr. Kathleen Lynn, Meg Connery, Jenny Wise Power. Interesting, there are four women. When Sinn Féin was, the executive was being set up, which was while Hannah was away, they were going to have six male prisoners, six of this, six of that. And the women said, well, we want six women on it. And they were ignored. And they said, no, we want six women. 
And in the end, they had to go and occupy the Sinn Féin's offices. And then they said, oh, OK, you can have four places. And obviously, someone had left or left. Hannah was on it there, but there was no extra number. There were only four. So that's really what I, I want to finish with, is in that I finished this side. I want to just have a few slides about my own campaign. But that Hannah never got that recognition. And I think one of the reasons was because the men were taking the winnable seats. There was an election that year. She was offered a seat in North Antrim, which is way off Northeast Ireland. She didn't know anybody there. She said, I'm not wasting my time. The men got the seats in Dublin. Countess Markovitz did get a seat and won it, but none of the women were actually offered anything they could win. And certainly she had, it would have been a hell of a lot of work. She said, I'm not doing that. And she never, ever did get that kind of recognition, which she would have had the proclamation been involved. They actually said that she might have been a minister. You know, so they recognized her quality there. But these were not quite so radical, to say the least, uh, in, in Sinn Féin. You can sort of see the body language and the expressions on these guys. I'll say no more. So that's why I'm doing this tour. But I also want to say that my grandparents and indeed my parents inspired me when it came round to me seeing injustice uh, that maybe there's still a fight ongoing. And this might resonate with some of you. I'm talking about gender equality. There are lots of other equality issues, obviously, in, in, in society, not just in academia. That's NUI Galway, formerly UCG. And I took a case against NUIG in 2009, and this was the data that I put together uh, for the Equality Tribunal. And you can see the junior posts, fixed term lecturer, so kind of contracts, junior lecturer, more than 50% female, college lecturer, which is where I was eternally, um, and then senior lecturer, big drop, and associate professor. That's where the glass ceiling is. And I was trying it four times in a row for over a space of, uh, of eight, nine years to try and get promotion. And I wasn't getting it, and I couldn't understand. So I said, how many women were promoted in, in this round 2009? It was the second time I was deemed suitable. But they said, oh, the government has an embargo, so we can only promote 17 out of the 30 people deemed suitable. I said, well, how many women were promoted? And I still remember the register looking down the list, and it took him a few minutes, and he's kind of looking down the list, and then he says, one. And he even looked a bit surprising. He obviously went down the list because I realized afterwards that she was ranked number 17 out of 17. So I saw red, and I said, I'm going to take a case. Win or lose, I'm going to use my grandmother's name. It'll get into the papers. Suffragette's granddaughter <laughs> takes case. <laughs> and as it happened, I won. And it was quite a landmark case because it was quite a difficult case to prove. And the point I would make is that actually uh, the lawyers helped me. Barristers said, you've got to prove you're better than any one of those 16 men or equal to. But it was me that did that. They framed it in terms of the law and all of that, and they were useful. They gave me that advice, which was essential. I won the case, I reckon, because all the ruling is stuff that I pulled out comparing people and, and all of that. And I did out a spreadsheet, the 30 people deemed suitable. And I, for my first thing was, where is the university spreadsheet? There's no information about how I got the marks I did, nothing. All I got back was the notes taken at my interview, which so that was what I'd said, actually misquoted. So this is just briefly, now just one more, more table and a couple of things just to show that this can be fun. So um, 32 men applied. So you think, well, less women applied. So well, yeah, okay, you'd have less women um, being promoted. And then you can see here, this is what it is. Um, and you'll notice that even proportionately less women were shortlisted and deemed suitable. This is the 30 here, seven of us. One woman promoted, six of us not. I won my case, there's five other women. I know they deserve promotion. It's thanks to them that the campaign's ongoing because I won the case. Um, but, and this helps when you do manipulate figures, or not manipulate, but you work with figures. That's bad enough, but when you look at the proportion, you see, well, actually, yeah, that 16 is 50%. The one is less than 10% of the women. And every single time in the last four rounds of promotions, proportionately less women were promoted than men. So there's a bias there. There is in favor of something. And what they were actually doing was promoting guys who were fitting a certain ca category, which was to boost the rankings of the university in the times higher. You know, And that means you're selecting for people of a high international profile who bring in large amounts of money, you know, who focus on their research. But that's all very well, but you say, they say that equally teaching and contribution to society and the university is equal. 
but then they promoted people who had only done research and it said that compared to them, I'd done much more teaching, but they got higher marks than me. So the ruling's interesting. I won't give you the whole detail of that, um, but it, that's really what was happening. So those five women still haven't been promoted. They're still junior lecturers. Unbelievable. This is nine years later. That's them. They've taken a case. Three, or four of them took it to the high court. Uh, one went to the labor court. They're still fighting. They still have, the university refuses to acknowledge that they should have been promoted in 2009. Imagine your career prospects. For us, it's really important. If you're a senior lecturer, you can get more grants. You can get more profile. You can get access to things. You know, they should be professors. Most of the men promoted at that, that time, if not all, are now professors. And, um, and all, virtually all the men who were not promoted, the seven who were not promoted along with, uh, with the, us six, are now promoted. And one of those women got promoted last week. Only one. It's appalling. And they just refuse, refuse, absolutely refuse to say that there's anything wrong. So just a few slides. The campaign is to support the women. That's the council that signs off on all the academic things. It's all professors, it's nearly all male. You saw the graph at the beginning. Heads of school, there's a few women in there. And there was great ructions inside because there were a few female professors inside at a meeting and we're outside making great hoo-ha and 81% male and the whole thing. So it was fun and we got, even though it's pouring rain or driving rain, not, you know, it was fun. This was a cartoon exhibition, uh, which again, I can tell you, I kind of bumped all these stories. You get one of them if you ask. Mightn't be time for them all, but. Uh, you can see it on the website. It went up in town, and it was a, a person who we don't know yet who started running this thing. It started off as just a general thing about a, a university president, a fictional character. But once I won my case, it started to be much more gendered, and this is just one of them to show what it was about. We've been taking a lot of heat on our gender discrimination issue. So it's time to address the problem as only I can. And then this is the press. President says other universities almost as bad as us. And he nearly did say that. He went to the Higher Education Authority and said, it's, we're, you know, every, it's a real national problem. You should sort it out instead of actually admitting that we are bottom of the heap. We're way worse than UCC in Cork, which is second last. Ireland is second last in the whole of Europe for percent senior female academics. Thanks to those women, the campaign goes on. It's about publicity. It's about bad publicity. If they had any sense, they would have promoted them three years ago. The campaign site. They didn't like, I wore a t-shirt at the class today, Mr. Brown's Boys. Some of you may know about Mrs. Brown's Boys, which is a comedy show. Brendan O'Carroll plays Mrs. Brown. It's quite slapstick. The president of the university is called Jim Brown. We had to. But surprise, surprise, the Feminist Society booked the table. They weren't allowed to display the t-shirts. We had them here as nice big yellow display because the yellow just ended up being our color. So, okay, we won't have t-shirts, well, we'll do up a big thing, and this was much better. <laughs> so another own goal. Uh, just, and they had to, they had, they, the women took it to the high court because they had no choice. The deadlines had all run out, and the high court was the last option they had. So a much bigger thing. When I won my case, I gave them the 70,000 euros I was awarded. I said, you're going to need it far more than me to fight your cases. It's about equality. It wasn't about me. I got loads of money, actually, back pay and better pension. I chucked the job, by the way, early, which is great. I was fed up with the place anyway. So I left, and then I won the case two months later. I could speak out and talk about the place, as obviously you can't as an employee. So there was also... And then this is just, there's a one man in, in the local press, Dara Bradley, he's brilliant. He just keeps coming at it. And so this is one of the rankings things. We're still bottom of the class. Like obviously the Jim Brown thinks we're going up in the rankings, but the rankings in terms of gender discrimination are not exactly, they're still the same, we're still bottom. So the press do cover it sporadically. They actually silence one of the press reporters in the Irish Times. She does not and cannot cover our activities anymore. Don't know much about it, but I, I think there was a phone call or two made. She doesn't cover. She said, oh, and I never seem to get anything published anymore. Mm. Power, silence, truth. The stuff that Hannah was talking about was far, far worse. But there's this silencing, this uh, people's in position of authority. We don't want to know. Quiet, let's move on. You know, it's the same kind of thing here, far less dangerous. So that's pretty well it. I have two, the last slide as well. But if anybody is interested, this is Micheline's three conditions. Again, I, I, I won't explain what they are, but we set up the campaign called that at wordpress.com. They tried to shut down the campaign site at one point, 
and WordPress said, we're not interested. We're, if it's only if it's pornography or def, you know, um, incitement to hatred. Uh, we, we're about freedom of expression, you know, because actually they were saying that what we were saying was potentially defamatory. And I was just saying with the students this morning, well, defamation is when it's not true. <laughs> the website was saying nothing that wasn't true. So that, if you want to follow it, there's stuff ongoing, and you can read back through three years' worth of blogs if you're still patient with that. And then finally, I just want to thank the National Library because all my early slides were taken by the National Library. That's all in the archives, the Shee's Skeffington Archive. And then there's a fundraising site, indiegogo.com, and it's called Hannah and Me Passing on the Flame. That's the, the, title, the running title for the documentary. We need funds to bring it to fruition. We've got funds to bring the camera crew over. That's ongoing. We'll get footage. We then have to bring it back. It's a small film company, but we need funds. So if you know any people, business people, that we're actually going to try and get a 501c3, which is a can channel big donations. If you have big donations to make, we'll get back to me. Uh, but anyway, spread the word, because it would be great to have this documentary come out next year. 2018 is the centenary of women getting the vote in Ireland. It's the centenary of it being passed in Congress in Washington, in, you know, but it took another two years to have it ratified for the federal uh, vote. So that's it. Thanks very much for your patience. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now we're going to open it up for some questions. Uh, let me ask the first that uh, you mentioned a five-year-old boy who stops them from taking down that handbill or that newspaper. Yeah. Tell me about, a bit right. about well, that. It was the poster which said, votes for women, now damn your war. So Frank puts this up in the front of his garden gate and it's torn down and it, he puts it up. And he's living in Rat Mines, which is quite a conservative British kind of area, but there's a few Republican hotbeds like the Shees, Gevingtons. So it's torn down again. So in the end, he says, Owen, would you stand by the gate and let me know if some, somebody comes out? I'd like to have a discussion because he's all about dialogue. You know, I want to find out why this person is tearing it down and maybe talk to him or her about it, you know. So Owen, I remember my father telling this story. He was standing there, some trepidation, what's going to happen? And he's still standing there, you know. And this elderly colonel comes from across the way and comes across the road and gently but firmly takes the five-year-old and puts him aside and then with a golf club lacerates the poster. And, of course, the five-year-old comes to and says, oh, God, I better go in and tell my daddy. And he goes in. But, of course, by the time he's gone in and got his father, the colonel has gone back into the house. <laughs> but it's kind of interesting that the five-year-old is set up kind of slightly politically aware and remembers it. I mean, he was kind of proud of being involved, I think. But at the time, I'm not sure he was so happy. <laughs> All right. Who's got a question? Micheline, do you feel that the gender discrimination at the university represents gender discrimination in the general Irish society, or do you feel it's, it's different from that for some particular reason? Yes, to both. <laughs> I think obviously there is a discrimination in society, um, but there is one thing that, say, in businesses now, people are realizing that if women have an equal part in the directorship, the business makes, does better. And that's actually been said. I saw someone stand up and say that in front of Jim Brown. You know, business has learned it. Why haven't you? Um, society generally, there was um, the, the Abbey. I don't know if you heard about the Waking the Feminists last year. The Abbey Theatre um, had a program of, of plays for 1916, the centenary, for the, and all but one were written by men. And Leon Bell in the Abbey saw red. She works back scenes, and she said, right, we're going to all come to the Abbey. They all... A whole load of people came and it was called Waking the Feminists and they just had a big protest saying, we've had enough, we want women represented. So there's a kind of slight snowball thing, but that, that kind of snow blindness. I mean, I came across a small little book on the history of Ireland, a little picture book which had over 2,000 illustrations. I counted, I think, five pictures of women and two of them were British queens. One of them was the Virgin Mary. And one, of course, was the poor mother with children during the famine because they have to have a mother because his people are starving. And Mary Robinson was in the corner in black and white, our former president, but there was nothing about her. It was just a picture. I thought, this is appalling. It was uh, relatively recent in the last, since 2000. Absolutely no consciousness of the images that are being portrayed there. 
So yeah, I mean, it's, ev it's everywhere. You know, things are far better. There is representation. People are beginning to you know, realize that actually it helps and works when you've got equality. But the universities, you think about them is they're not answerable to anybody. There you have no board of trustees. They have, uh, they have no shareholders. They make their own decisions. The academic council does it all. We know everything. We know what's best for the university. You don't have to interfere. So it's all done in that quad behind closed doors. And that's difficult, is trying to, to cut through that. Um, but the Higher Education Authority has now also set up a, a task force. And they have now said that if you don't win, there's a particular award now for uh, giving, uh, trying to ameliorate gender equality in the university called the Athena Swan. It's in Britain, and it's now come to Ireland. If you haven't got the bronze, which is the first in the rung, you can't avail of some of the funds. Well, I can tell you they're falling over themselves. But NUIG has not got it yet again. And I think it's, there's a mention of the women in the court cases. How can they get an award when they're still fighting women in the court for gender equality? But that's great, because once you start saying funding is going to be withheld if you don't get your act in, in order. So yeah, I don't know if that answers it, but there's all nuances and things, and it's, it's a general thing. There was, there was a hand in front here as well, so. Oh, was James Joyce in favor of the feminist movement? <laughs> he wasn't, he, I think he wasn't really political. Like there's even, you know, like he portrays Frank as, the, you know, getting the pacifist list and he wouldn't sign it. He was quite disdainful of anything. Personally, I don't actually know, but I don't think he had much to do with it. He wasn't against equality for women, but he wasn't exactly someone who's going to act for the vote for women. What? He, he, yeah, he was anti-war, but he wouldn't sign anything that she, Scavenger, wanted him to sign. So, yeah, I agreed. He wasn't antagonistic. He was, you know, supportive. But I wouldn't consider him ever, ever having had done anything for equality. But that's where I'm, I'm in plenty colleges. I don't know enough about James Joyce to know exactly about his personal life and that. But that's my sense about it. That he certainly wasn't involved at all in the Franchise League or any of that. And, in fact, he left Ireland very soon after, so. Frank disapproved of him, but that doesn't mean he wasn't a feminist, you know. <laughs> he, was, he didn't approve of how he left with Nora and all of that, but that was Frank being quite extreme at one end and Joyce probably around the other. Um, so now we're nearly 20 years since the Good Friday Agreement, yeah. and given, you know, your, your grandparents' you know, involvement with nationalism, with republicanism, do you feel that today republicanism is still a strong part or a part and parcel or even a factor in feminism within Ireland and the Irish identity? Feminism, there's a, well it is, it's always, like it's, it's not, like even then, there was never, like you weren't feminist or republican. So there were a lot of feminist republicans and there were feminist unionists. Um, the Republican, obviously, during the Troubles, as we like to call it, it was really, you know, because everybody was killing everybody, and us in the South were wary of the North, we didn't, you know, and things were going on were terrible. Now it's at least the peace, but it's a very, we were just saying it over at dinner, like it's quite tenuous, and with Brexit, we don't know. But I now I could stand corrected. Again, I'm not in the North. There were lots of feminists who were fighting, you know, um, what's her name? Williams. Betty Williams, I think, is actually involved in. There's a launch of the Hannah's writings. Margaret Ward, her biographer, has launched a book by, and she's, Monica McWilliams is launching it in Belfast. Now, I'm not saying she's true green Republican, but, you know, there is a Republican sense of feminism in, in linked in that. Um, so, yeah, they're not detached, but I, I don't know if it's totally seen as a very strong strand of things as lots of feminist Republicans, and as I say, they don't have to be all Republican either. Hi, um, I'm an aspiring journalist, um, photojournalist actually. Uh, do you have any advice for young women who are hoping to go into that field, you know, with re regard to feminism? Well, I suppose you just look out for, I mean, I don't know much about it, but look out for stories that maybe, you know, have a difference. You know, there might be some photojournalists who just think, oh, that's the women's thing, I'm not going to bother. 
Um, but you know, you'll find stories that interest you. And, and photojournalism, as you know, some of the illustrations I had, is a really good way to tell a story. So if you can see something, you know, that tells a feminist story, then go for it, and hopefully it'll get published. I mean, that's the problem. Uh, and just keep be open to things, you know, be open to what you can see. Not, try not to do, you know, like people who do videos nearly always get sucked into doing weddings. Well, you could end up getting sucked into covering sport or that, which is fine. Actually, there's a, one of, I think the image we used here is done by a female sports journalist, so I wouldn't run down sport. But there's all kinds of things and ways in which you, you could probably cover it that, that might have a feminist angle. And that'll be obvious even without you actually saying anything. That, that's my sense. I don't know. Look out for it and see if it's a challenge. I, uh, I was actually studying at UCD last semester uh, oh. abroad, and I was surprised um, that three uh, out of the five professors I had were women, but none of them were Irish. Um, and the two men that I had were Irish. So I was wondering mm. if you knew where UCD ranked since. Um, UCD, I think, is that because there's not that many universities. U University of Limerick's top with 33% senior female professors. Um, no, senior female staff, it's a combination of um, senior lecturer and professor. And UCD, I think, has about 30, 31. So it's better. It's interesting that they were foreign. Yeah, there was, um, I had a Canadian, um, Russian, and uh, Indian. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I might read it into it too much. Yeah, you were lucky, though, it fascinating. Yeah. yeah, I think some students, particularly in NUIG, will never see a female professor. And they won't even know it. I mean, when the thing came out, the students didn't really know. They were taught by these women. They're outstanding. I mean, several people joined the campaign simply because they named the, the different women and said, she's been my most inspiring lecturer I've ever had. How come she's still at this level? You know, so it's not recognized. But the students don't necessarily realize, of course, what the ranking and all of this and why, you know, what professors. And in Ireland, obviously, professor is different than here. Um, but yeah, interesting. Thank you. Who else? I was curious about um, women represented in elective offices in local elections. Is the, what does that look like? Mm. Well, okay. Well, I've been mean, starting with the presidents. We've had female presidents. Yes, I know. That's why I'm curious about the... Not so much when the, it comes to... Okay. We've had now, again, and that's, <laughs> it seems to be a kind of theme, is, is there are now gender quotas for people going for, for candidates. It's been caused quite a bit of fuss because men are finding that they're being... You know, but we're kind of saying, you know, 50% is actually... And anyway, they're only standing. They're not pushing you out. If you're better, you'll get elected. And if you're not, then the woman will get in. So, so you know, that is it's only a gender quota, 30%. But it's beginning to come in. And in the local councils, I wouldn't know offhand. I know that the National Women's Council, it's now 10 years ago, produced a book of all the institutes, all their semi-government things. And the, the, it was stunning. Well, I remember the one that stood out for me was Board Nagan, which was the, the horse board. And it was 100% male. A couple of those things were all male, and they're still very, very dominated by men. But in terms of county council, city council, I think it's a bit better. There's some you know, fairly strong women involved in that, but the extra percentages, I'm not sure. I think it's better than the government or the, the Oireachtas, the parliament. Okay. I, um, I was just curious what you believe the university's reluctance is in, um, even after the suit, not promoting the five. I think it's because, uh, naming no names, there are people who just are never wrong. I think the previous president would have said, right, we messed up here, um, this isn't great, but you know what, let's just promote the women and get rid of the would have seen. But this man never backs down ever on anything. Uh, you know, and, and that's a real failing. He, you know, he just stonewalls. The first thing he said to the five women when they went in, you know, right after me winning it, he says, you don't deserve promotion. You know, oh, yes, I'm open to meeting the women. And then the very first thing he says, you don't deserve it. 
You know, so it's not, and, and, and the main reason I think is not just his character, which is, you know, I mean, it's a strength in other ways, you know, gets the higher rankings and all of that, that's focused on one particular objective. But it's also that, you know, that was a corrupt round. There were guys being bumped up who should not have been. I was told later that there are lists of names, and I don't know if it pertains to that round of promotions, with FT written, written next to the names. That's short for fast track. I could well believe that these guys were being fast track. I suspect that they were being appointed at college lectureship because they couldn't be appointed at the senior lectureship for financial reasons, but they were promised promotion in the next round. And that was at the expense of everybody else. But they don't want that to come out, so therefore the easiest way would have been to promote them, but no, we're right, you're wrong, you know. I don't want to be personal, but it is actually. And, and he's got a bunch of cronies, the Mr. Brown's boys, who, you know, the way when you've got a position of power, people all, it's starting to fall because he's due to be replaced in January. Apparently there's people leaving, the rats are leaving the sinking ship. It's interesting. <laughs> the ship might bog back again. I hope the new guy will manage to be a bit more humane. I, by the way, I tickled me that I'm the president's distinguished speaker series here, and I'm hoping that my president sees this in some form or other, um, because I don't think I'll be his distinguished speaker ever. And it's a real honor to be received here with courtesy and favor, because, yeah. We'll tweet it to him. Any other questions? Hi, um, I'm an aspiring political journalist and going into the realm of journalism and politics that are both very heavily male dominated. I was wondering if you had any advice for sort of standing your ground in an extremely like male dominated world where they're going to want to silence your voice. Mm, just keep talking. <laughs> it, it's, it is hard. And I mean, you know, like I say to people, you know, do something, speak out, say something. But sometimes you have to decide, is this going to lose me the job? You know, I, I have a funny feeling that one of the reasons I didn't get promoted was because I was a troublemaker, and I don't even know why or what. But I have to admit that I was involved, as many were, in the campaign when Ronald Reagan came and got an honorary degree from our university in 1984. And a lot of us were against that, and I was one of the people. I mean, it was one of many. Other people got promoted. I don't know, but I have a feeling. So you have to think about yourself, but at the same time, stand your ground and by God, you're as good as those men, and better maybe in times. And you've got to keep that in your, in your mind and say, I'm going to keep going. But it is hard if people are not believing in you. And if they are, then you're fine. But, you know, that's the hard thing is to just say, right, I'm as good. It's not that what I'm writing. It's just because, you know, yourself, you do gender blind trials of things and women do really well. You know, so, yeah. And get support. Join a union if that's, I don't know, in Ireland, I always say to anybody writing, I say, if you're in a union, you'll get a bit of support, you'll get free legal advice, you'll get people who've seen all this before, get some support if, there, if you do find you're in difficulty about stuff. Anyone else? Hey, just let me ask one question that we came up at the master class. Where would Hannah be if she was here today, 100 years later? I mean, if she is. She'd be still campaigning for equality. I suspect she'd be out there with me, the leaflets and the, you know, the, the, the gender thing, and, and probably taking a wider view. I have to admit that mine is uh, it's nature focused, but you know, looking at the wider picture. I mean, a bit like what you're saying in Northern Ireland. I'm less politically involved in the, the capital P. I think she'd be, you know, looking at North South too and trying to get more reconciliation in that in Ireland and with, with women in a prominent role. I mean, I wanted to phone her when Mary Robinson got elected. It was just such a turnaround for us, you know, as women generally. Unfortunately, it didn't go much beyond the presidency at the time, but it was great. All right, well, thank you very much. Give it, let's give a round of applause.